<laughs> okay, y'all turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to take our study back up. And I told y'all we're going to really take our time going through this. And mm -hmm. it, you know, some of the greatest preachers that have ever lived, certainly some of the greatest teachers, spent a lifetime teaching Romans. And I don't mean it's all they taught, but they would start each each they would start a Roman series on a Friday night or whatever it was, you know, just to show you how much times changed. When Martin Lloyd Jones taught Romans, he did it on a Friday night. Now, how many people are you going to get to a Bible study on a Friday night? In America? Not really. <laughs> of course, it was London, but even in London today. But he did it on a Friday night, and on an average, they said, there would be about 1,100 people there. Imagine that. I mean, times really changed. Oh, yeah. All right, before we get started, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, again, we thank you for the honor of calling you our Father. Lord, let us never take for granted what it takes to make that possible. We know it took you sin in your Son to become flesh, to die for us upon that cross, and to raise from the dead, to sit as our advocate at your right hand, Lord. And this is how we come to you. And we never want to take that for granted. Every prayer we want to send up in that thought and in that vein. Father, we ask that you guide us tonight by your word. We thank you for the answer of prayer. And we ask you to remember all those that have asked for prayer. Lord, we don't have to call out specific names. You know who they are, and you know what they need, and you know what they need better than we do and that they do. We ask that you meet all these things through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 All right, <clears throat> let's just read our introduction. Each, each time we're going to um, read the part. I uh, kind of broke it in an outline, and then we'll read the part that we're working on. And right now we're working on the introduction. And look, repetition is a good thing. So let's read Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul. A servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end, or for the purpose, ye may be established or built up. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant brethren. Oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let or restrained hitherto. He wanted to come to him that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now that's his introduction. In the next two verses he states his theme for the whole letter and it's the gospel of Christ. And then he goes on from there. But in this introduction we've gone back and we've taken up verse 1. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, y'all remember what Paul's doing. Paul's writing to the Romans, and let's always keep our audience in mind, okay? These Romans, here we are, we'll just say it's over here. It's about 58 AD, give or take. And Paul's writing to the Romans, and does he tell the Romans, you need to be saved, you're all going to hell? No. He said, your faith is spoken up throughout the whole world. You've already been called to be saints, and I thank God for you. So when he writes to all that be in Rome, is he writing to all the Roman citizens? No. Uh -uh. He's writing to all the saved in Rome. Well, is he writing to all the saved in Mobile? No. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, this letter could be called the Mobilians. This is yeah. doctrine for saved people. Isn't it? Right. Now, what is a saint? You know, it's amazing that all the bad doctrines that really got started early started in the Roman church, isn't it? Yeah. And yet, where was the most basic, fundamental letter written to? To Rome. Now, when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to the Romans. Had Paul preached the gospel to these Romans when they got saved? No. Uh -huh. 
Had anybody, any apostle, been to Rome? No. Did Peter ever in the Bible go to Rome? No. Not, the, the only traces you're going to find of that are at the Vatican. There's nothing in history that suggests it. Now, the reason we talked about that they needed that is for their apostolic succession, something they invented. There's no need for an apostle to have gone there. Paul says he wants to go there, and in chapter 15 he tells us we know no apostle had been there because Paul said he didn't go behind other apostles, did he? He said, I, I go, God sent me to those that haven't heard. So, where did these Romans then hear the gospel? Well, it would appear that they heard it on the day of Pentecost. Remember when uh, Acts chapter 2, the Lord poured out the Spirit on them? And there were all those people that heard Peter and them speak, and Peter spoke in his language, and they all heard it in their own language, mm -hmm. didn't they? You've never seen anyone imitate that, have you? Uh -oh. You know, you've heard people gibberish and yeah, stuff like cool. that. And, and look, I don't mean they're all, I don't, I'm not attacking anybody, I'm just telling you, you have never once seen a man stand up and speak in English, and one guy hear it in Spanish, another hear it in right. German. It's never happened. But on Pentecost it did, and after that. Now, when Peter spoke, there were a group of people there that he refers to, or Luke refers to, writing Acts, and he said they were Jews and proselytes from Rome. So then where did the Romans appear to first hear the gospel? Mm -hmm. all, all indications are from right there on Pentecost. Now they go home, and when they get home, who had been their teachers? The Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're Jewish proselytes. That means the Gentiles are trying to get to God by becoming Jews. Well, when they get back to Rome, who do you think is still going to be their teacher? The Jews. Now, what did those Jews have that the Gentiles did not? The Old yeah, Testament yeah. Scriptures. Sure. So they're the ones that's supposed to be the authority. They're going to be the ones teaching. So when Paul writes this letter, what are some of the things that are foremost in his mind? I have got to establish some things about the relationship between Jew and Gentile. The, the Any law. difference. Mm -hmm. And the law in the believer today. So in this letter, what does he do? He explains all this. Well, right off the bat, before he gets started, the first thing he's got to do is he's got to establish his own credibility, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. You remember, everywhere he went, people were attacking his credibility as an apostle. Yep. You know, this guy's Johnny come lately. He's not really an apostle. He wasn't with the twelve. He persecuted. He did this. He did that. So if you're going to write a letter to someone and it be received with authority, the first thing you're going to have to do is prove your authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Paul does in verse 1 when he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ... And we did these how they ascend up. He starts with a servant. But y'all know what? Every saved person is a servant of Jesus Christ, aren't they? No matter how we're serving Him, we are a servant. So he starts out and says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. But then he goes up a notch. He said, and I'm called an apostle. Doesn't mean people refer to me as an apostle. It means Jesus Christ called me. Mm -hmm. So my authority is number one, I'm bought and paid for by the blood. And number two, I'm one of a select few men that Jesus Christ revealed Himself to in His resurrected flesh. He taught me personally and He sent me out. Now Paul proves this in the Galatian letter. He said, look, I came down there preaching the gospel and I had never met Peter yet. I hadn't met the apostles yet. In fact, I was in Damascus when I got saved and I went out to Arabia and there was three years passed before I ever met Peter and yet I was preaching the gospel. That's possible because I got the gospel direct from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm a servant, but more than a servant, I'm an apostle. And more than an apostle, look what he says last, separated under the gospel of God. Now this seems like this is not an ascension, but it really is. He's separated. Now, I told you all last week as we begin this that I personally believe that Paul is using a play on words here. All right? The word Pharisee means separate, division. It's a separatist. What had Paul been all his tail? We'll put him up here in red as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. And what did that mean? He was an expert in the law. He was an expert in the law. And folks, he was the foremost. He said he excelled beyond his... A countryman, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He was trained by the preeminent teacher, Gamaliel. And this man then was the cream of the Jewish crop. And what did he think of himself? Stay clear of me. Sinner, sinner, unclean. The Pharisees thought that they were separate from the other group. Y'all remember how many times they would accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of eating with sinners? 
I mean, any Jew that wasn't a Pharisee, the Pharisee said that's a yeah. rotten sinner. So Paul had separated himself, hadn't he? Mm -hmm. And now what he's saying is, but when the time came, God separated me. I had uh, self-separated and thought I was something, and when the time came, God knocked me right down into the dirt, knocked me off my high horse, and He separated me. Now to prove His authority, He goes on to tell us something. When did God separate Him? You remember what He said in the Galatian letter? From His mother's womb. Exactly. Now, you know, uh, we're going to get into this, but does God know all His works from the beginning? Oh, sure. yeah. So then what Paul's basically saying is, my authority is I'm bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. I am an apostle appointed by Jesus Christ, but ultimately my authority is this, God the Father's prepared me for this from the womb of my mother. And we can see that in Paul's life, can't we? Mm -hmm. Do you all think it's a coincidence that Paul was born in Tarsus? Mm -hmm. Tarsus was one of the second most educated Jewish centers in the world behind Alexandria. It was a unique mixture of Greek culture and Jewish culture right there together. And we find Paul knew the Greek poets, didn't he? Mm -hmm. In Acts, he quotes them twice. How about was Paul a Roman citizen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think that's a coincidence? No. See, God made sure he was a Roman citizen because what's he going to need to travel all over the world? He's going to need to pass freely at me. And he said, I was a natural born. How about his education? You think it's a coincidence his parents sent him at a young age to Jerusalem to learn from that man? Look, the teacher he went to learn from is like we would say today, I've got a Harvard education. Mm -hmm. This man was prepared by God, and yet what did God allow him to do? Blaspheme, murder, mm -hmm. and persecute. Yeah. Couldn't he have stopped it? Yeah. yeah. But when the time came and God said, now's the time, bingo, here it comes. Mm -hmm. Now look why. What did God allowing Saul to persecute do to the glory of God? It magnified it. Folks, if God can forgive that joker oh, right there, yeah. who can he not forgive? That's right. Right? If God can forgive one that murdered men, women, and kids for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, he can forgive anyone, can he? But it's even better than that. If God can not only forgive this man, but by the power of His grace turn that man into a tool working for Him, then who can He not? Y'all, I mean, y'all look at the example of Paul. You know, lots of people believe in uh, an absolute free, sovereign will in a human being today. But let me ask y'all: Can you can you find in Acts nine any indication of remorse in Paul on the road to Damascus? No. Can you find any indication of sorrow? No. Can you find any indication of wanting to join the church? And no. What do you find instead? He had a mind set against God. And what did God do? God went to work on it. Okay? Now that's one of the greatest things about this man. He was separated. He was called to preach the gospel just like the other apostles. But his call was really more incredible than theirs, wasn't it? For instance... Peter and his uh, brother and, and his partners, James and John and their dad, had fishing business, didn't they? And the Lord walks by one day and says, drop all of that and follow me. And what do they do? Follow they me. follow me. Is that normal? No. no. Folks, that's not normal, is it? Uh -huh. See, that's the power of God. That's the effectual call of God. How about Matthew, a publican? That means he was collecting tax money and doing very well. And he's sitting there doing his job, and then what happens? The Lord says, follow me. And what's he doing? Follow. Gets up and follows. You see, that's amazing, isn't it? Sure is. But it don't amaze me like this character. Uh -uh. Folks, this guy, look, y'all realize Paul was heading to the top? Oh, yeah. You know, I think about, um, uh, what was the, uh, uh, John Kennedy Jr., I think was his name, that died in the plane crash? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Jr. Ted. Yeah. Oh. Oh, in the plane crash. Yeah, yeah. not Teddy. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right, right. If he had not died in that plane crash, what do y'all reckon he would have wound up? He would have wound up there. If he wanted in the White House, he'd have got there, wouldn't yeah. he? Would and, you know, it's, I mean, it's just he, he was heading that way. Yeah. Well, here's a young man that had all the training, all the, the knowledge, all the talent, all the charisma, everything. And on top of that, God gave him a burning zeal because he said he was the most zealous of Pharisees, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And then what did he become? The most the zealous apostle. Yeah. Now that's who's writing this letter. So Paul says, my authority is from God Himself and it's from the foundation of the world. Flip over to Galatians 1 and we'll read how he says it. You know, to get Galatians 1, we probably really ought to start in verse 6. 
Now, Paul's writing to these Galatians. Look, it's my opinion that this is the first letter he wrote. And I've got reasons for saying that. And if anybody's ever interested, I'll be glad to share them with you. But certainly, it was either Galatians or 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Some say 1 Thessalonians. I personally believe Galatians. But the very first thing Paul has to prove to the Galatians when he writes to them, look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So who had picked Paul to be an apostle? The Lord. The Lord and God the Father mm -hmm. had picked him to be an apostle. Now he tells the Galatians in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, these Galatians are beginning to believe a different message, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And y'all remember what another gospel is always going to be. It's going to be a perversion of the true gospel, isn't it? Generally speaking, when people pervert the gospel, what do they generally add to it? Works. Works. There. Where that works. You've got to do this or that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't mean you've got to do these things in obedience after you're saved. You've got to do these things to be saved. Now, what were they telling the Galatians? You've got to be circumcised and keep the law, right? Mm -hmm. So Paul says, I can't believe you're falling for these things. He says in verse 7, this other gospel, which is not another. In other words, it's not two messages. It's not a gospel. They're calling it the gospel, but it's not the gospel. He says it's not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now you want strong language, here it comes. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it. He says, as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now, does this mean that we, you've got a friend that's, that's been twisted and, and is preaching a false gospel that you say, well, he can just go to hell? No. That's not what it means, let him be accursed. What does the accursed have to do with Could you and I curse someone and send them to hell? No, no. we couldn't do that, and why would we want to, right? Yeah. What he's really referring to is, flip over to chapter 3, verse 10. He said, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. When a man puts himself under the covenant of works, what has he made himself? Cursed. Yeah. So Paul said, look, the person that's preaching this gospel, a, a combination of your works and the blood of Christ, he's cursed. Let him be a curse. Don't you follow him? Right. If he's wanting to try and keep that law, you let him keep that law. Now, you know, that's not a bad thing. Do no. hey, y'all remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus? And he said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have mm -hmm. eternal life. And Jesus right away told him, you're all wrong. He said, there's none good but one. Right. But the man was asking, what can I do? Now what's the answer to that question? You can't do anything. There ain't nothing you can do. The Lord did it. You've got to believe on the Lord. You can't do anything without Him. You can't. Now he said, but if thou will enter into life, if you're determined to work, you're going to work your way into heaven, no problem, keep the commandments. And the fellow says, which ones? Right? Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, the Lord doesn't even start with the, those that uh, somebody can always, you know, you can't yeah. prove that. Well, I do yeah. love Him with all my heart. He, he skipped those. Yeah. He said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and He went on down the list. And the last one He said is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the rich young guy said, all these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now, y'all hear what that man said? Yeah. Nobody's picking on him. That's what he had been taught. Yeah. In his mind, did he think, I'm in good standing mm -hmm. yeah. based on his works. Yeah. And he just said, I do love my neighbors myself. And he's the rich young ruler. Was there anybody in Jerusalem starving at the time? Yeah. Yeah, we know Lazarus was laid at the rich man's gate hungry, don't we? Mm -hmm. If this guy had really loved his neighbor as himself, what would he be doing? He'd be able He'd to be helping. Yeah. So the Lord said, if thou will be perfect, because what was he really claiming to be? Perfect. perfect. He said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then come follow me. Mm -hmm. Now people, y'all you know, you know 
uh, there's some preachers that'll take that verse and say, see, you better sell everything yeah. you got and bring it to me. Is yeah. what they tell you. Yeah, you right, but what the Lord was really trying to do with him was this. He was trying to make that man subject himself to the tenseness of the law. I mean, that law is harsh, isn't it? It sure is. And Paul said that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We try and work righteousness under the law, and we find out i got a problem here, don't we? So that's why Paul says, let that man be accursed. Because the one that thinks he's going to go to heaven by his works, what's the only thing that's ever going to declare otherwise to him? The law. Oh. He's going to have to be guilty under the law. Yep. So he goes on and says in verse 10, Do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Boy, that's a, a mouthful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. hey, you know, one of the uh, things that will happen when you, you teach, uh, invariably you're going to have things wrong, especially at first when you first start. you got so much wrong, but you got the desire to teach. And you teach things that are wrong, and look, in my case, they're on video and everywhere else. And then you start studying, and you see, hey, I've got this wrong. And you see, and you know, the Lord reveals mm -hmm. something to you. Well, if you want to please men, you know what you do? Never mention it. Just bite your tongue and never say it. But folks, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. If you're a servant of God, you know what you do? You say, look, I need to show you now. I said this and this is wrong. And, here, and you just correct it. Mm -hmm. And nobody's ever mad. Nobody. In fact, I have found that the Lord has basically wiped that old thing out of their mind. Half the people say, I don't ever remember you saying that. And you say, thank you, Lord, right? Mm -hmm. But Paul's saying, I can't bend on what I'm preaching here because I don't serve men, because I'm not an apostle of men. Now watch him say in verse 11, I certify you, brethren. Where are you at? Where are you at? That's what I'm saying. I don't know where you're at. Bro. Galatians 1.11? Yeah. Oh, no, we're on three still. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm sorry. All right, Galatians 1.11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me to the Galatians was not after man. Right? Why? Because, for, because I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but I received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, why is Paul so certain that his message is the right message? Because he got it directly from he the Lord. He got it straight from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he says next, For or because you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. All right, so Paul says to these people, I'm preaching to you the gospel. And I'm going to put up here, the gospel. Now he says, you know it's the gospel because of how I got it. And if you don't believe how I got it, just ask around. There's a lot of witnesses that were there. He says, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. Was Paul a zealous Pharisee? Yeah. Very zealous, he says, but when it pleased God. That's some of the greatest words in the Bible, mm -hmm. isn't it? When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, when it pleased Him to reveal His Son in me. Isn't that amazing how mm -hmm. that spoke? He didn't say, when I finally gave up and decided to come to the Lord, or when I decided that I was going to join in with the cricket. He didn't say that. How was a, who, how was a Christian made, folks? Called. God Almighty calls them. God apprehends us is a word Paul uses, he says. When, when it served God to reveal His Son in me, in order that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So what Paul's basically saying is this. Okay, y'all want to know if my message is legitimate. Well, you all know what I was doing right up until that moment. What was he doing from here to here? Persecuting. Persecuting. Yeah. So he certainly wasn't taught any gospel there, was he? Mm -hmm. He said, I was persecuted and had no chance of being taught by the apostles or any other Christian. He said, but right here when it pleased God, boom, he got me. He said, and when that happened, I didn't even meet with flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Basically, he saw one man, he was three days without eating or drinking. One man came in sent by the Lord, scared to death, by the way, put his hands on him so he could receive his sight. And then Paul immediately starts talking about Christ. Mm -hmm. But he says, I didn't meet with anybody. 
He said, how could I have got this message from any other way when I was in Damascus when God saved me? If God had saved Paul in Jerusalem, people would say, well, see, he, he slipped in with mm -hmm. him. He saved him on the road, didn't he? Sure, yeah. Now, he says this, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. After three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. And he goes on down the list and he's going to say, and by the way, when I finally did meet with Peter, James, and John, nobody wanted Titus, a Gentile, to get circumcised. So why are you Galatians now saying this? The Galatians were saying to Paul, look, you, you, we believe your message about Jesus Christ, but the man's got to be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. So Paul says, look, Jesus Christ never said anything to me when he was teaching me about that. None of the other apostles, when I went to Jerusalem, I had Titus with me, a Greek, and he went in and out with us, and Peter never asked him to be circumcised. Uh -oh. Why now are you asking me to do that which none of the other twelve are asking? Now that's basically what he says. And then he goes on and he said, and by the way, and all he's doing is proving this point because he says, by the way, what about when Peter came to Antioch after that? And Peter knew that the law and the ceremonies had been nailed to the cross, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But under peer pressure, Peter got scared of the Jews that came from Jerusalem, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And he started separating again. And do y'all remember what Paul did? Paul stood up and called him on the carpet. Mm -hmm. He stood up in front of him and all. He said, hold a minute, Peter. Why are you acting like there's a difference here when you've been eating with the Gentiles all week? He looked to, in today's language, Peter, you have sat right here and ate pork chops and shrimp and everything else all week with us. You know that that means nothing, and I agree with you. But now that these Jews come from Jerusalem that are slowly falling back into the law, by peer pressure, you're scared to stand up for what you know is the truth. And do y'all know that was an important moment in the it church, was. wasn't it? Peter could have said, who do you think you are, Johnny come lately? But by the grace of God, you know what Peter said? He had to say, you're right, Paul, because he corrected it. And when he wrote 2 Peter, he said, y'all read what Paul wrote. He said, there's the Holy Scriptures, you read them. So then Paul stood up for the truth of the Gospel. If he hadn't have done that that day, and the twelve would have underwritten this false Gospel, how long would the church have lasted? Not long. You see, God had been preparing this man for a long time. Yeah, yeah. This is the man that's writing to Roman. This is what he's proven. He's proving his authority came directly from the Lord as his message came directly from the mm -hmm. Lord, didn't it? Okay. Alright, let's go on. Um, tell you what, this separated from my mother's womb. Y'all go back and find the book of Jeremiah chapter 1. You know, because people um, are uncomfortable with the doctrine of election. And again, I'm not saying, you know, picking on anybody at all. It's a hard doctrine and it's one that I don't believe we'll ever understand in this lifetime. We can believe it, but understanding it's something different. But because people are uneasy about the doctrine of election, they play around with what Paul meant when he said that God had separated him from his mother's womb. And they say that his mother's womb is symbolic of Israel. But is Paul in any way using symbolic language in that passage? No. If he had been speaking in parables and allegories, we'd say, well, let's look at it. But when he says he separated me from my mother's womb, what does he mean? He means his mother's womb. Now watch another example in Jeremiah 1. Uh, we're going to skip who is the words of Jeremiah, verse 1. But verse 2 he says, To whom the word of the Lord came, to Jeremiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammi, saying, Who was the king? And he goes on talking about all the kings it was. But here's the word that came to him in verse 4. God speaks to Jeremiah, who was a very young man at the time. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now y'all consider that. What do you think? That's any way symbolic or is that flat fact? That's flat fact, fact isn't it? Mm -hmm. Notice what he says. Before I formed thee in the belly. Folks, that whole thing about abortion and the chicken and the egg and all, that God said I formed thee. 
But before we go any further with that, maybe there's somebody watching that at one time had a does God Jesus Christ that He paid for the sin of abortion? He most yeah. certainly did. Yeah. Folks, look, don't ever let Satan push you into a corner over because he'll do it. He'll put up the sin that you're most guilty of and he'll put you in a corner and say, Now, how could God save you? You know what your answer is? Saul. Saul there. Could he save Saul? Yeah. Then how effective is the blood of Jesus Christ? Yeah. How yeah. gracious is God? He's a merciful God. Absolutely. But he says, Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That means I set thee apart for something. Mm -hmm. Did he have Jeremiah handpicked to be a prophet? Yes. Yeah. Now, if this is true of Jeremiah, someone would say that's a unique situation. Well, why couldn't it be true of Paul? Do you, would it surprise you if God knew exactly what He was going to do with everybody from before the foundation yeah. of the world? It would surprise me if He didn't. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah, yeah that'd be way for it. So then why couldn't each saved person recognize that if you're saved, that God had already handpicked you from your mother's womb? And planned your life. And planned and laid your course out for you, right? Like. You know, when we face hardships in this life, I was talking to Don earlier. and um, he, Michelle's not... Don't, 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 we got a friend in... Uh, they're from Idaho, but her husband and little girl were killed in a car wreck about five, six months ago, I guess. And now there's her and her other little girl left. And it was just out of the blue on the way to church. It was horrible. And she has really struggled. And the thing that she's keep trying, trying to understand is, you know, why? And, and we're not going to know why. But the thing we have to believe is this. And we were talking about it today. And she, she reckoned, she, yeah, I, you know, she knows it. But the fact is this. Does God have a course laid out for each saint? Yep. My course ain't your course. Nope. Paul said he had run his course, didn't he? He told us to run the course set before us, right? That's Does God know best? Yep. All right, so God set this course out then for Jeremiah from his mother's womb. Paul said he was set out from his mother's womb. Let me ask y'all, how about Moses? Moses was born, and did God already have him handpicked? Yeah. Said he was a goodly child, and God saved his life from the from the midwives and whatnot, didn't he? Mm -hmm. How about Samson? Was it known from it? What? How? I mean, there's many of these in Scripture. How about Jacob and Esau? Mm -hmm. Right. Before either one of them ever did a thing, God said, "That one I'm going to take, and not that one." Mm -hmm. All right. So now, if we believe this about Jeremiah, and we believe it about Paul, can we believe it about ourselves? That's what I was going to say. I got mad. Yeah, okay. We'll go over to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians 1, after he introduces himself in verse 3, Paul's going to tell these Ephesians something that's just absolutely wonderful. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, if you're in Christ, what's not yours? Everything. In Christ is where everything is at, right? Look at the next verse. According as He hath chosen us. Did you choose God or did God choose you? He hath chosen us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Yes. Now, when did God choose you? Before the foundation, before the foundation of the world. Before. So what Paul's basically saying to these people in Rome is this. I'm a servant, I'm an apostle, and oh, by the way, I've been picked to write this letter to you from before the foundation of the world. You want to know my authority? My authority is I've been... Uh, chomping at the bit to get to Rome to preach to you. Rome was the center of the world. Yep. You know, that would have been the best place to get a good church going, to go out from there. And Paul couldn't get there. He said, I've been restrained, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Thank God God restrained you. Right. What did that force Paul to do since he couldn't get there in person? He wrote mm -hmm. the greatest letter in the Bible. He wrote the book of Romans. And because of the Roman situation, which God foreordained, Paul had to lay out not just a, an issue or two they were dealing with. You know, when he wrote to some of the churches, there were a few little things he was dealing with. Them with. But in Rome, what's he got to deal with? Oh, All oh, foundation oh, doctrine, oh, doesn't he? Yeah. And there we've got it. Bless God, we've got it. And this is what right. Paul's telling them. This is my authority. God picked me to do this before the foundation of the world. Now, go over to Romans 8 and we'll see Paul confirm this to the Romans themselves.
You know, another example we could have mentioned, I forgot from my notes, but John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb, right. wasn't he? Mm -hmm. You remember when Mary walked in pregnant? Right. John started jumping around in the womb, didn't mm -hmm. he? Alright, now, in Romans 8, let's read verse 28. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Yes. We yes. know that all things work together. All. Now, what does that mean? Everything. 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 All things work together for good to the whole world. No. no. Them to them that love God. To them who are called. the called according to His yes. purpose. Did God have a purpose for Paul before the foundation of the yes. world? Yes. Did God call Paul while he was persecuting here? No. no. Did God call Paul while they were stoning Stephen? No. He, he could have... God could have converted Paul after preaching to Stephen. Mm -hmm. He didn't. Uh -uh. When did he call him? Before. On the road to the mountain. His time. Paul said it was due time, like, mm -hmm. a, like a baby being born. In fact, Paul went on to say he was like the one born out of due time, wasn't he? So then God called Paul at exactly the right time over here. At just the right moment, he called him. And everything about it works for Paul's own good. Now you would think that this man probably never had a day go by that he didn't think about those sounds of those women and children that he yep. was imprisoned. And, but what did that cause him to do? Better. It caused him to be work harder. It caused him to serve God. And it also caused him to do something even more, uh, uh, how would we go about saying it, more profitable. Did Paul work harder than all the other apostles? Yes. Yep. He said so. Mm -hmm. What would that cause anybody to do? Wouldn't it cause you to kind of begin to think something of yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe get a little puffed yeah. up? Mm -hmm. What do you think kept Paul from getting puffed up? He said, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. God let these things happen, amongst other things, in order to keep this man humble. See, God knew, I'm not going to take this man and reform the Jewish nation. I'm going to take this man and send my son's name into the world. And that's what he did, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, there was a fellow from... Uh, uh, Europe that wrote a, a book on the 20 greatest men of the of the last, uh, maybe even been history, I forgot, but the 20 greatest minds is what it was. And um, I, I should have got his name, I can tell y'all. But anyway, the man's an atheist, doesn't even believe in the Lord, and he had, of course, Plato and, you know, all the normal list and all, Shakespeare. Do y'all know who that man had in his top 20? The Apostle Paul. Paul. What? Yeah. The Apostle Paul is one of the greatest minds. And the man said essentially, look, I don't believe you know, the, in this God he wrote about, but that book of Romans is the greatest legal document that's ever been written. It is. It is the most logical document that's ever been written. And that man said, it took a great mind to write that. Who gave that man his mind? The Lord. Yeah. The, Lord. Yeah. the Lord was training him, wasn't he? So now he says here in verse 29, For, why do all things work together for good for the saved? For y'all watch that word. I've told y'all many times when you're studying your Bible, y'all look out for these sentences that begin with this word. Verses. Four is important, isn't it? In light of. In light of. Because. Due to. Why do all things work out for our good? Because for whom he, God, did foreknow. He, God, also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He, God, did predestinate, then He also called. And whom He called, then He also justified. And whom He justified, then He also glorified. I mean, y'all see why all things have to work out for our good? Because God foreknew. Did Paul say he was a chief sinner? The chief of sinners, he said at the end of his life. Oh, didn't he? All right. Did God foreknow exactly what he was going to do? Yeah. Did he know who he was going to do it with? Yeah. Did he then predestinate? Yeah. Yeah. Now, folks, I don't know how you can get away from that word. That word means exactly what it says. To predestinate is to destinate before, isn't it? Yeah. So then God knew what he was going to do. God laid out everybody's course, and when the time comes, what does God do? He calls. That's right. Now, there are two calls in the Bible, and you've got to make sure you don't get them confused. There is the general call of the gospel. In other words, the gospel's preached, and he said, preach it to all creatures, didn't he? That's the general call. And in the parables, that's likened unto like a net going out into the deep, right? 
Now, when a man preaches the gospel, it, I saw. When a man preaches the gospel, does he go out and look around and try and find the elect? No. Is that our job? No, we don't. You wouldn't know. That's not our job, is it? Mm -hmm. How did he tell us to preach the gospel? Like sow and seed, right? Yeah. Scatter it. Is all the seed going to bring forth? No. Nope. He said, but you do that, it's like that net. You throw that net out there. You throw a, a, I always use a shrimp net. You dump the shrimp net over and you drag it, make it a pull for, you know, four or five hours, whatever, and you pull it in. What do you get? Shrimp. Everything. Everything, Everything yeah. in the world. What do you want? Shrimp. 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 You know, when you somebody like uh, me or I remember my old man would go shrimping with different friends or whatnot. He didn't have a shrimp boat, but you want to keep everything. Mm -hmm. You got one bucket for the crabs and one for the yeah. But when you're a shrimper, man, what do you do? Want shrimp. You want them shrimp. shrimp. That's what you're after. So that net is like the general call of the gospel. It goes out there and folks, it produces results in varying degrees in all kinds of people. Just guilt will get people to do things and emotion and but does every uh, little thing that springs up, does it bring forth fruit? No. Oh. He said, so what's going to happen is that general call goes out there, right? <clears throat> and people respond to it. But what about this call we're talking about? This is the specific call of God, and does anyone refuse this call? No. no. He said, for those that He foreknew, He did also predestinate. Did he say those that he foreknew, some of them he predestinated? Yeah. Yeah. So how many did he foreknew did he predestinate? Oh. All. And it says those that he predestinated, he called some of them? No, he, he called, called all, all of them. them. And of all those that he called, what did he do next? He justified. justified. How can you say that that call right there is not effectual? Folks, if God justifies you, what does that mean? You're made righteous. You're saved. You are a child of God. It's accounted to you. And he said not only that, but in God's mind, what's he already done? For all those, he's glorified. Do mm -hmm. you see why all things work together for our good? Because God knew what he was doing before the foundation of the world. And whatever your course is, he laid it out for our good, didn't he? Have y'all ever seen anyone with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ that had a harder road to toe than the Apostle Paul after mm -hmm. salvation? You read that list over there in 2 Corinthians. That's, that's hard, isn't it? But you know, when you read that, you would think, man, that's, that's, that's horrible. And do you think Paul's complaining today? No. He's glorified in it, isn't he? Did God know exactly what he was doing with the man? Do you think God doesn't know what he's doing with us? we got to put our trust in the Lord, don't we? Y'all remember when we go through things and we don't understand, and there's so much we don't understand, don't, don't give up on God. Don't fret. Don't get nervous. Just remember, God is in control and God knows best. And will God put anything on you that He won't give you the grace to go through? No. He said He would never do that, right? Never. Does God know best? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So whenever we talk about what God's doing here, this is what He's doing, and He's doing it from before the foundation of the world. Now another verse to back this up, a proof text. Go to Acts 15. speaking here and he's speaking on the fact that all of a sudden the, the Gentiles have started getting saved and and remember they were mad with Peter at first what are you doing going to a Gentile's house mm -hmm. and Peter basically explained to him he said look God gave me this vision God sent me and right there with me watching God poured the spirit on him just like he did on us at the beginning now who can I who can am I going to argue with God mm -hmm. and the people said well amen and God's called the Gentiles right but they, they creep up later going back into legalism and they have this council but James speaks up and he says something he says uh, about the Gentiles being saved look at verse 18 known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world all his works are known mm -hmm. is the call of the Apostle Paul at God's reaction to Israel's rejection of his son Folks, God never reacted in His entire existence. Mm -hmm. right. There's no so you know when we react, that's always bad, isn't it? Yep. Stop, take time, don't react. Use your use your thinking process and act. But when God called Paul, He called Paul at that exact moment. Why? Because that was the time. that was the time. 
Folks, doesn't God know what time is passing? Yeah, yeah. You know, if you look in the Scriptures, it's kind of amazing how often the Lord does this. Have y'all ever noticed how far He'll let His people go into peril before He grabs them? He'll let them go far as they want to go. You remember that night on the Sea of Galilee? The waves were coming over, mm -hmm. weren't they? The Lord was asleep. I mean, literally, the ship started sinking and they cried out. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as the storm blew up and they were scared, the Lord could have said, oh, hold, calm down, calm down. Would that have been as good for them as no? So what did they learn? They learned to trust, trust the Lord. Lord. How about out there in the wilderness? What did the Lord bring them out there for? To teach, teach them to you. trust the Lord. Over and over through the Scripture, we see God let His people get into dire straits and then He snatches them out. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with this man Paul. God let this man Paul get in and become an, literally go into utter blasphemy, didn't He? And then He snatched him out of it. Now, when we talk about God's ways being known, and we've got to have to admit that along with God knowing His ways, He knows all His people. He also knows the right time, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. Does God know when is the right time to call someone for salvation? Sure. Yeah. Have you ever thought about all the times that you uh, weren't saved? Yes. You look back on your life, and yeah. you look back on the things you went through. Can't you all look back and see God directing your course? Sure. Well, I certainly yeah, can. Okay. And I can see one time there when I thought I got saved, because I, I told you all before, yeah. I you know, raised my hand and went and did something. I didn't know the Gospel. But that whole experience now, as I look back on it, I thank the Lord for it. It was all for my benefit now, and it's going to be for His glory. Right. Okay? So now when the Lord does these things, He knows what He's doing. And there's no coincidence that He allowed Paul to blaspheme and persecute. It does something else. Does it magnify the glory of God? Remember when Moses asked God to see His glory? Remember up there in the mountain? Mm -hmm. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And God told him, he said, okay, Moses, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before thee. I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful, and I will show forgiveness, essentially is what he's saying, to who I will. So when God wanted to, to make his glory known, what's the first thing that come in his mind? Goodness, goodness. and mercy. Now, y'all think about that. Is there anyone good as God? Anyone merciful as God? No. Did it mag If God would have saved Paul as a young Pharisee who had slapped a couple, uh, you know, other Jews, that ain't, that ain't nowhere near as impressive as God showing the mercy He showed to Saul, is it? Yeah, right. So then all these things work together for God's glory, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, what? The, one of the amazing things was at the church in Jerusalem. Do y'all remember when the Paul went to Jerusalem the first time? When Saul of Tarsus got saved and came back to Jerusalem and walked in the door, what do you think that was like? Boy, you can imagine, can't you? Yeah. So what did that what did that do for the other apostles? It showed, it showed yeah, them too. I mean, y'all just think about just the prejudices yeah. that it probably brought up in. Mm -hmm. You think about all the things that God did, and yet you know everything He did, God does all things well, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. So the calling of this man was exactly like that. It was exactly like God planned. Now. Um, one other thing about this. <clears throat> I'm going to read a statement to y'all that I, I really just love. You know, go about how to say it. This, this ought not only be the most amazing thing to us, but the most humbling thing for a Christian to consider is that God knew us before the foundation of the world. And God acted on our behalf from before the foundation of the world. Now, someone would always say, why did God let this happen? You know, that's the question you get all the time. Um, one of the questions I, I get asked fairly regularly is, why didn't God stop the devil? Right? Here's the devil. God creates Adam, and Adam is made to glorify God, isn't he? Mm -hmm. There he is. He's in the right position, the right place. Everything's right, and along comes the devil. Couldn't God just have pushed him yeah. Couldn't God have stopped Adam? Mm -hmm. God could have done anything he wanted. So then, according to God's foreknowledge, what did He allow to happen? He allowed Adam to fall, didn't He? He fell into bondage. And folks, Adam fell into bondage in something far worse than the devil, sin. Look, sin, this is what we fall in bondage to. And there's nothing worse in the world than sin. So it, it's, it, it's just it's horrible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So God allows Adam to fall. Why? So he can show him, show him, 
So he could send his son to redeem him. Yep. Yeah. Now, you know, there's an old saying Most. that... What well, they say in a good story, you've got to have a hero, a villain, and a damsel in distress to need rescuing, don't you? Yeah. Don't we have it all? Yeah. I mean, folks, God allowed His people that He knew before the foundation of the world. He knew every one of them that He was going to save, didn't He? Yeah, well, and yet, yeah. what did He allow that race of people to, to fall into bondage so when the time was right, He could send His Son into the world, and what would His Son do? Redeem them. Now, you know, the, the picture is in Hosea. I always like to mention the, the story in Hosea. God tells Hosea to marry a harlot. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, look, whether it was a vision or not, that's not the issue. The issue is God in this story says you marry a harlot. Marry an unfaithful woman. And oh, by the way, she's going to cheat on you and have kids with other men. And she did. Yeah, she wanted you. So finally, because of her infidelity, Hosea puts her out of the house. And to sum the whole thing up, you read it, it's like beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. This woman falls so low, she gets out there, and the whole time she thinks these other men are taking care of her, and you know who's taking care of her the whole time? The Lord. The Lord through Hosea, her Hosea. husband. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not in the picture. There she's out there. She falls so low that she winds up on a slave block. Mm -hmm. There she's got to be redeemed from slavery. And in my mind, I'm not saying this is how it happened, but in my mind I can picture this woman. Y'all know when they sold a woman in slavery, it wasn't just a housekeeping they were interested yeah. in. Yeah. They got her up there, strip her down, and there she is, and all the men in town are laughing. Who wants her? She, she's, you know, used mm -hmm. up and she's this. And, and they're laughing and carrying on. Who would give a plug nickel for her? And all of a sudden, who speaks up from the back row? Hosea. Hosea. And Hosea redeems her. Was she worth redeeming? No. no. To him, it was. to him, was there anything inherent in her? Mm -mm. What does that story teach you about her goodness? No, mm -mm. Hosea's. You know how you say Hosea, Hoshea? It's the name Joshua. What does mm -hmm. the name Joshua mean in the New Testament? It's Jesus. Jesus. It's the same name, yep. folks. Jesus Christ allowed us to fall into utter bondage. Utter adultery, sinfulness, contamination, filth, and all for the purpose of coming into this world to redeem us, didn't He? Now, why would God want to do this? Go back over to Ephesians 1. You know, we're told in the Scripture that God, amongst many other things, is love, right? And what's the thing that Paul says is perfect, that God's wanting to reveal to mankind? The perfect love. Right? Perfect love casteth out fear. If God's wanting to manifest Himself to human beings, and the main picture of God in that manifestation is His love, what did Jesus Christ say was the greatest form of love one human can show another? To lay down their life for them, right? And yet He says, look, some men have done that, haven't they, for their friends? There's been a lot of mothers that have laid down their life for their children and would do it over again. But whoever died for their worst enemies? Nobody would do that, would they? Who Christ died for? Folks, sinners are enemies of righteousness. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was that the greatest act of love the world had ever seen? You. And it's still... For us today, I'm going to say this and nobody get mad, but it's the second greatest act of love we ever have seen, isn't it? Nobody's ever pictured anything greater than what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. Would that have been possible if man didn't fall? No. And so we look on that action and we see and all of a sudden the love of Christ begins to, to appear to us and we begin to see it and contemplate it, don't we? But you know what happens one day? Jesus Christ said He came to manifest the Father, didn't He? Well, I see Christ on that cross, but all of a sudden the day came when something occurred to me. Hey, wait a minute. For God, the Father, so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Now, what would you rather do as a parent? Would you rather suffer and die for your child, or would you rather sit back and have to watch your child suffer and die? Y'all see what God did? Mm -hmm. So then how did God manifest Himself to us? Through this act right here. And through this act, the Son allows us, brings us into the throne room where we might know the Father. And all of it is to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit's glory, isn't it? Yeah. So when you get to heaven and you look on Jesus Christ, what do you think is the first thing you'll think every moment you look at Him? Hey, He walked on the water. 
Now you ain't gonna think about that. He died. For if me. There's the one that gave his life for me. And when you see the Father on the throne, what will you say? He gave his there's the son. one that gave his only son for me. Wow. Now do you think there'll be anything in his service we won't be willing to do? No. Would we have been able to be in that position if we wouldn't have been redeemed? No. You know, angels can see, angels created from eternity could see God's power, couldn't they? They could see God's majesty. They could see God's intelligence. They could see all the attributes of God. But there's one thing they would never be able to know. The love of God. Because without the Gospel, God's love couldn't be known. And so Peter says that when the Gospel was prophesied in the Old Testament, even the angels desired to look into it. They couldn't understand it, could they? You know what Paul says now the angels are doing? They're being instructed in the love and the glory of God through what? His treatment of the church. The angels learned something about God through what God did for His church. What did they learn about? Incredible love of God. Now this is what God says in Ephesians through Paul. Again in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, didn't God, wasn't He able to create Adam holy and without blame? Yep. Yeah. Couldn't He have created, I mean, He created angels when He wanted them that way, didn't He? Yeah. But what about that last part? That we're going to stand before Him for all eternity, holy and without blame, in love. How did He get that in love part? By the act of His Son. Right? This is God's plan. So for all eternity, what will His... I'll put up here His bride, because in a figure, this is what we're likened to. How will the bride look at the groom for all eternity? With love. With love like you can't imagine. What made that possible? The greatest sacrifice that's ever been. This is God's plan. It's so far beyond anything we can imagine. And when you think about this being His plan before the foundation of the world, that's staggering, isn't it? I want to read y'all a quote real quick before we start or stop. Uh, old preacher on the Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, I can hardly believe the truth concerning... I can hardly believe the truth concerning myself, but I have no problem believing it concerning God. Mm -hmm. I know what he means. I can hardly believe that God knew me and picked me before the foundation of the world. When I think of myself, I can't understand that. And that election blows my mind. But I've got no problem thinking it of God. I would have a problem thinking God didn't know what He was going to do before the foundation of the world, wouldn't you? I would have a problem with someone telling me what most people believe is that God had to go to plan B when Adam fell. And that's what people teach. That God had to switch gears and now go into redemption mode. But not so, folks. Satan didn't do anything God didn't allow him to do. This is God's holy plan of redemption, and it's all to His glory. In fact, it's called His eternal purpose, isn't it? This is the greatest news that's ever been. In next class, we're going to go into the gospel of God, and the gospel means the good news. But it ain't just good news, folks. It's the greatest news, okay? Are you have any questions about that tonight? Wow. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we quit, okay? Our Father, thank You for these wonderful truths from Your Word. Lord, we pray that You enlighten our hearts and minds, open us up that we might meditate on them, that we might not just hear them and let them go, but that they might create a change in us, Lord, that they might build us up and edify us and strengthen us. Just the way that natural food does our natural body, we ask You to do for our spiritual body, Lord. Create in us a love for the Lord Jesus Christ that's greater than it was yesterday. And even though it's not what it's supposed to be, Lord, we thank You for it, and we thank You for overlooking all our indifference and our lukewarmness and just our silliness at times. Father, lead us and guide us by Your Spirit and build us up in grace and truth that we might magnify our Savior throughout all eternity. In Christ Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.